Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURG, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, p-values and confidence intervals. Right, just to uh, recap, I'm not a statistician, I don't have any formal qualifications, but I think these are um, concepts that uh, anyone who is involved in clinical research or any research should understand and hopefully this will help some of you who are on your uh, way to doing research and critiquing papers. Okay, let's consider an example. So let's assume that you're doing a study, um, a cohort study of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery and you're looking at risk factors for infection. So that's a topic let's assume you're interested in. And one of the factors you're looking at is smoking. And let's say that you've got some data on smokers and non-smokers. And because this is a cohort study, you have a lot more non-smokers than smokers, right? So this is not a case control study. So you're starting off with these factors and then you're following patients up to see if they've had infection or not. And let's assume that these are the numbers that you've got. Uh, so you've got 600 non-smokers, 50 smokers, and you've looked at infection rates in these two groups. And you find that among smokers, 60% have had an infection. However, you've defined an infection and 20%, uh, so a much a smaller proportion of non-smokers have had infection. Right, so there's a clear difference in infection rates. So you've got 60% versus 20%. And then you uh, have to ask yourself the question, what does this difference mean? What does this threefold difference in infection rates mean? Is this the truth? Can you generalize this? to the wider population of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery? Or could this be that this is just a chance finding? In this one study, you found a threefold difference, right? So what would happen if you repeat the study? If you did the study another time, or third time, fourth time, or two dozen times? Now, obviously, because these things are not fixed in stone, um, and, and uh, nature is variable, uh, clinical outcomes are variable, you could get a lot of different results. You could do another study and find a result and that shows um, that gives you rates of 50 and 30 percent, or you could do a study that gives you fairly equal infection rates and so on and so forth, right? So how do we get to the true rates without repeating the study a thousand times? or without having to study the entire population of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery in a region. We've got access that we can never really get to the true rates. You do a study in your institute, you will find rates that are probably slightly or sometimes very different to what's reported in, in, in this particular study, right? All we can do is we can rely on estimates and probabilities. Okay, so with that in mind, and assuming that this study was well designed and the cohort is generalizable, can you then say, oh, we can rely on this estimate of 20 and 60 percent, uh, which is a threefold difference? And can we state that smokers are three times more likely to get postoperative infection? Can we do that with confidence? That's the question. In other words, are these results significant? So you've got the rates, but then you've got to decide on whether they are significant. So when we talk about significance, I think it's quite useful to just have a little um, think about the difference between what we call clinical significance and what is meant by statistical significance. So as you can see in this in this table, clinical significance um, answers a question um, whether this difference that you see is of clinical importance or clinical relevance. Whilst in statistical significance, you're looking to see if the difference is likely to be true or real, right? And clinical significance is based on your judgment as a clinician, your knowledge, value, experience, and, and wisdom. So you decide what is clinically important um, for you to recognize as 
uh, something positive uh, and and then to imply the result the the uh, and then to um, accept the results and incorporate them in your practice but a statistical significance has to be based on statistical testing and statistical methods right so you might say that right, we've seen a 40% increase uh, in infection rates in smokers, which is a threefold increase. But uh, the question is, how do we know this is real? Uh, to which a clinician might say, well, the study is really well done, seems to be free of bias, so it's internally valid, it's generalizable. This is the population I see in my practice. So, uh, so what's the problem? Um, I'm quite happy with this significant, with what I consider to be a clinically significant difference in infection rates. To which a methodologist or a statistician might say that this difference that you see could still be due to chance. and Therefore, we need to understand the probability that this difference occurred just due to random chance. In other words, he or she is saying that you need to be doing statistical testing to ensure that this is not due to chance. So before you start um, contemplating a statistical test or before you do statistical testing, you need to think about the hypothesis. So the hypothesis here is fairly straightforward. Uh, when I say hypothesis here, I mean the null hypothesis. And, and that would be that there is no difference in infection rates between smokers and non-smokers, right? So that'll be the null hypothesis. And I've got the table here again with the numbers that we've just discussed. And um, just so you can recollect the numbers. And then, um, and take it from me that the statistical test for significance in uh, with data of this kind, which is categorical data, is um, done using a method called the chi-square test, right? We're not going to go into the details of chi-square testing here, but that's the test we would do. So um, in the olden days, we used to calculate the chi-square statistic, use degrees of freedom, and then figure out the probability of getting um, at least this chi-square value or more than this chi-square value from either a table or a calculator. But these days you can run a chi-square status uh, test really quickly using an online software like SPSS. Okay, so let's uh, assume that you've done this chi-square test and the um, calculator gives you these values. It says that the chi-square statistic is 41.6, degree of freedom is 1, and the p-value that you get as a result of doing the statistical test is less than 0.01. It is actually um, less than 0.0001 in this particular calculation, but, but that's okay. So, so it's very, very low. So what does that p-value mean? So the p-value here means that it refers to the probability of getting a result at least as extreme as this due to chance alone. So in other words, the probability of getting a result like this or um, a greater difference than this is extremely low, right? On that basis, where you have a p-value that is extremely low, which is you know much less than one in 100 or less than 0 0.05, we have to say that if the null hypothesis is true, then this result is extremely unlikely to have occurred. OK, which means because the p-value is extremely low, we're going to reject the null hypothesis and thereby implicitly we say oh, we will accept the alternative hypothesis, which um, uh, is that smoking and infection are associated. OK, so I hope that explains the meaning of the p-value. Now, the value of 0 0.05 is arbitrary. It's just a convention that you say that um, uh, if the chances of observing the result as extreme as this is less than 1 in 20, we'll be happy to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, some people um, don't like this arbitrary value and would like to go down even further to 0 0.01, uh, but, but that's fine. You've got to um, a priori before the start of the study decide what p-value you would accept as your uh, cutoff. Or, or your threshold. Right. So, um, some of you might have uh, listened to the talk on type 1 and type 2 errors. And, and the point to note here is that the p value is essentially 
the same conceptually as a type one error, which is the probability of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, and keep in mind that p values simply not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Um, when you start off a study or a, a statistical test to test the null hypothesis, uh, you've got to keep in mind that you can never prove the null hypothesis. You can only gather enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And if you reject the null hypothesis, then you have to, um, then that means that uh, you're accepting uh, the alternative hypothesis. Other point to note is that the p-value does not reflect effect size or the strength of the association. So um, if you get a relative risk of say six or eight or 10, that doesn't mean that your p-value will get smaller and smaller. Um, and then the converse is true as well. And finally, you just have to keep in mind that, that the p-value on its own is not sufficient uh, to judge a uh, model. So you need something else, and that's what we're going to go on to next. If you did want to uh, read up a little bit more about p-values, there's a really good article um, on the internet, free to access from the American Statistical Society uh, Association on p-values, and the link is here. Right, so the other concept we're gonna to discuss today is um, confidence intervals. So let's keep the example we've discussed in mind again. We found that infection appears to increase risk of, um, sorry, smoking appears to increase infection risk threefold. In other words, the relative risk is three, and we've got a really low p-value, okay? Now this relative risk of three is one estimate, or a point estimate, but we're not clear yet as to how precise this estimate is. Or in other words, what's the range of the interval in which most values uh, are likely to lie? If you do 10, 15 studies, what's the likelihood that you're going to get um, values that are around uh, the point estimate of three? And when I say most, in statistical terms, in statistical parlance, we refer to uh, 95%. Okay, so what's the range of interval in which 95% of the values are likely to lie? is the question. Now, it, could it be 2.9 to 3.1? That'll be fairly close, narrow range. Or could it be as wide as 0 0.5 to 10? That'll be a, a very wide range, okay? And this range or interval is what we refer to as the confidence interval. We often see confidence intervals being de depicted or described in forest plots, which are part of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And you would have come across plots like these, where um, the squares in blue refer to point estimates from individual studies, and the lines around these point estimates are the 95% confidence intervals of that effect size um, uh, in that particular study. So in this particular forest plot, you've got four different studies with point estimates and confidence intervals. Okay, so I've done some calculations for this particular example, and I found that the 95% confidence interval for this particular um, relative risk of three in this study was between 2.3 to four. Now the precise calculations are tricky, they're, they're beyond the scope of this lecture, but um, we're fortunate that there are lots of software and online calculators that you can use to get confidence intervals for a variety of point estimates. So, Going back to um, both p-values and confidence intervals, let's compare them. So p-values um, enable a rapid assessment of significance. If somebody's got a p-value for you, you look at it and you know um, straight away whether it's a significant result or not. While a confidence interval gives you a range within which the real value may lie. Okay, so it also provides you um, strength of the association so you know how, how uh, likely the, uh, uh, the association is going to be and how strong it's going to be, and it tells you the direction of effect. So if it's a relative risk of more than one, you know that smoking increases risk of infection. If it's a relative risk of less than 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, then you know that smoking uh, may be associated with less infection. Okay, so the confidence interval gives you uh, both strength and direction of uh, the effect. Right, a couple of little points to note. 
So when someone says 95% confidence interval, it does not mean that the interval is 95% likely to contain the effect size. Uh, we'll never know what the truth out there in the population is going to be. So what the 95% confidence interval um, refers to is the likelihood that if you do 100 other studies, um, 95% of them will give you a point estimate that will lie within this interval. So that's what the true meaning of confidence interval is. Okay. And when you're writing a report, when you're looking at studies, it's, it's ideal, it's encouraged by lots of journals, lots of editors to, that uh, you describe both the p-values and 95% confidence intervals for any um, uh, statistical uh, method uh, you can use. Okay. Now, the final point really is that these values, the confidence intervals and the p-values, uh, depend on a number of factors and in particular sample sizes. So let's just take the same example again. You've got smokers versus non-smokers compared to uh, infection as an outcome. And you know that we had 650 patients to start off with in the study. And uh, let, let's just assume somebody else has done a really small study, but very similar in design uh, and uh, assumptions. So and these numbers in red are from another much smaller study, but very similar in design and assumptions. Okay, and you find that the infection rates in both groups are fairly similar. It's just that the numbers are really low. So if you then compare the parameters in the larger study and the smaller study, what you will see is that the relative risk is the same because these studies are very uh, identical in design, but the p-values in 95% confidence intervals suggests that the strength of evidence is not, not that high in the smaller study. So in other words, p-values and 95% confidence intervals de depend a lot on sample sizes. Okay, so I hope that made sense. So to summarize, p-value is simply the probability that the observed value, or a more extreme one, is due to chance. So it is the same conceptually as a type 1 error. Conference intervals, so 95% conference intervals, refer to the interval or the range of values within which observed values from 95% of uh, similar studies uh, from a given population would lie. And p-values and CIs should uh, both be reported uh, when you're doing um, a, 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 an analysis. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.